Welcome to Season 4 of Public Health On Call, a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. I'm Josh Sharfstein, Vice Dean for Public Health Practice and Community Engagement and a former Commissioner of Health in Baltimore City. Our goal is to bring scientific evidence and experience to current topics in public health through engaging interviews with scientists, community leaders, policy experts, public health officials, clinicians, and more. If you have ideas or questions for us to cover, please email us at publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Hi, Public Health On Call listeners. I'm producer Lindsay Smith-Rogers here to introduce a very special episode, a collaboration with one of Baltimore's top podcasts, No Picks After Dark, and host Aaron Dante. No Picks After Dark is a culture and community-based podcast sharing real people's stories and has been the Baltimore Sun's best podcast for the last two years. For this episode, Aaron's listeners submitted questions about COVID-19, and Dr. Josh Sharstein talks through some answers. They also discuss Baltimore's unique response to the pandemic and how to think about safe gatherings during the holidays. We are so excited for this episode, and we hope you enjoy listening. You can check out Aaron's podcast at nopixafterdark.com. That's N-O-P-I-X afterdark.com. Let's listen. Aaron Dante, thank you so much for joining me on Public Health On Call. It's an honor to be on Public Health, public, No Picks Are Dark to be on Public Health, you know, On Call is to meet you guys and hear you. This is a, a I'm so happy. It's a blessing. So um, we um, are fans of Public Health On Call of your podcast, No Picks After Dark, um, particularly our producer, Lindsay Smith Rogers. Um, I'm starting to get into it myself here, but could you just introduce your podcast to our listeners? Well, my podcast is, um, it was, uh, it's a Baltimore Beyond podcast. It's always giving the voice to people who are unheard. You know, I talk to anybody, you know, I make sure, I want to make sure their stories are heard. I've talked to a lot of West Baltimore families, East Baltimore, and it's all about just getting that story out so people can understand that Baltimore is a beautiful city. And there's no different from any other city out here. And we all might have our little problems, but guess what? There's some amazing people that make the city. And that's what Baltimore is all about. And fortunately for me, the listeners have followed. Uh, I won Best of Baltimore for uh, Baltimore Magazine and Baltimore Sun two years in a row. So it's been a blessing. And I just keep on trying to give the message. And tell the, you know, our, my listeners a little bit about public health on call, like from John Hopkins. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, this is a podcast we started uh, during the pandemic um, to share some good information with people in the, you know, all the anxiety and uncertainty of those early days. And we certainly do a number of episodes um, on COVID, but we broadened it to other public health issues. We've talked about the health impacts of racism, climate change, uh, violence. Um, We usually do 15 to 20 minute interviews with people. Um, And, you know, we also have been uh, growing an audience and picked up a a couple um, awards. But really, uh, it's what's fun for me is to just get to talk to people and hear about what's on their mind. Uh, I love love it. I love it. One of my favorite episodes is when you were uh, talking to um, African-American doctors. And it was just so important to hear about that because growing up, it was always taboo to go to the doctor. Uh, Just growing up, learning about the Tuskegee experiment. You, 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 as a black male, you were like very hesitant. And just knowing about my family history and having cancer in my family is just something that now it's we go to the doctor and that episode was so important. And I wish that many people could hear the episode. And I, I said, I want to plug the episode because that really got me hooked on the show. Well, that's great. That was a great episode. And it is, you know, absolutely the case that there, you know, there's so much racism in medicine and that casts a long shadow, keeps people from uh, getting care that they need. And even today it's keeping some people from getting the COVID vaccine. Yeah, but you're, that, that leads us into our conversation, I guess. I mean, the COVID vaccine and whatnot. Uh, I know we have the holidays coming up. You know, everybody loves pumpkin pie, sweet potato pie, families. Thanks even I think about families. And when I think about families, I think about we're all getting back together again. And that's what I think this episode is perfect, perfect timing for it to come out. Well, first things first, it's safer for people to get back together again when everyone's vaccinated. And I, it makes me really nervous, particularly if there are going to be some older people around the table for others to be there who aren't vaccinated because you just don't want a tragedy where you get together for Thanksgiving and people are in the hospital a couple of weeks later. Josh, you're, you're exactly right. Uh, just we, my family has canceled the family reunion for two straight years. 
because of things of that nature. So I definitely, and I know Thanksgiving last year, not a lot of people saw their, their parents, grandparents, and this year, let's talk about it. Let's, let's get into it. Let's dig into it. Let's dig into it. Um, quarantining, like uh, quarantine. Uh, do I quarantine if I'm vaccinated and I'm around people? Or the, how does it work? What's the, what's the definition of quarantining? Um, this, is, this question is from Mia, one of my listeners. Quarantining, tell us a little bit about that, Doc. Sure. So the first thing is, if people are sick, they should stay away from other people for a period of time, at least 24 hours after their symptoms get better, at least 10 days overall. You know, Because if you're sick, you could pass it on to someone else. So staying home when you're sick, particularly with COVID, but if you have symptoms and you don't know that it's COVID, you know, get tested, and in the meantime, stay home. Now, let's say you're not sick, but you're just exposed. And so, uh, you know, you're with somebody, you're hanging out, and then it turns out that they have COVID. You know, the next day they call you. That's not a great call to get. A lot of people have gotten that call. Um, What do you do? Well, the good news is if you're vaccinated, you don't really have to change what you're doing that much. They recommend that you put on a mask inside. And if you do get symptoms, you get tested and stay home. But you don't have to stay home if you're vaccinated. If you're not vaccinated, however, and you're exposed, um, then you're at much higher risk of getting sick. And for that reason, it's recommended that you stay home at least until you have um, a negative test uh, around uh, day five or seven. And uh, as much as staying home uh, for 14 days, that would be the most conservative thing to do. Wow. Okay. That, that, now, what about children? I mean, I know that children are just getting the vaccine and whatnot. Um, you know, they're going into it. What are some of the health you know, benefits for these kids again. I mean, I know a lot of parents are a little nervous, skeptical about the vaccine for the children. What can you say about that? Sure. So um, there are really now two groups of children who have access to the vaccine. They're the kids 12 and up, and now they're the kids 5 to 11. So for the kids 12 and up, there's a lot of experience with this vaccine. You know, many, many, many kids have been vaccinated. And it is pretty clear that the benefits exceed the risks. Um, The benefits are you know, not getting COVID, not getting hospitalized for COVID, not getting long COVID, which can cause all kinds of problems for kids, and even not dying. That's very rare, but it will help you to get your kids to get vaccinated. So there's a lot of benefits. There are some risks. Um, There is a a low risk of getting a condition called myocarditis, which is a temporary condition of inflammation uh, around the heart. There's a very low risk of an allergic reaction. But when everybody looks at it, you know, all together, the benefits, the value to to, uh, young person's health, much greater than the risks. Now let's switch to the 5 to 11, because that's the breaking news. That's just really in the last few days that we're talking here that 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 has become available. That also, the evidence that's available is that the benefits exceed the risks, and that's why it's been recommended unanimously by these advisory committees. Um, But we don't have as many kids in that group vaccinated yet. And so if there are rare risks, we don't know them yet. And so over time, we'll get more information. The benefits include not getting sick with COVID, not being hospitalized with COVID, lower risk, um, I think, very, very likely of not dying with COVID. And so um, there are a lot of benefits. The risks aren't fully uh, characterized because we don't have as many people uh, vaccinated yet. Uh, Several thousand kids have been vaccinated so far in that younger age group. So over time, we'll get more data. We'll be able to um, have a better sense. And I think some parents who may be in the wait and see group will be able to take a look at the data and hopefully make a decision to vaccinate their kids. Doc, you said something that is actually another question that one of my listeners chimed into. They said, so Christy said, um, what do we know about long COVID? How big of a risk is it? And do we have any idea how what it causes for some folks and not other folks? Sure. Um, it sounds like you get a lot of questions about COVID. Well, just a little bit, just a little bit, because because you know what? It's, there's so much information out there, Doc. That I just you get overloaded. You just like I don't know who to believe. Who do I listen to? Sanjay Gupta. Do I listen to you know who do I listen to at this point? And we love that you are in our backyard, one of the best medical places in the world. And this is why we we're lucky to have you guys come on. Uh, well, um, it's great to get questions that are on people's minds. So long COVID. Uh, basically refers to the fact that people can get sick with COVID, but not completely get better. In fact, they get these lingering symptoms. They can get headaches for months. They can get very dizzy and uh, weak when they stand up. Some people are fatigued all the time, and it can be really debilitating. Some people can't go back to work. Some kids have trouble going back to school. Now, exactly how common that is isn't really known. You know, there are studies that suggest it might be in just 
one in 20 people who get COVID, maybe one in 10 people who get COVID, depending on the study. And then, of course, the severity of symptoms. The sicker people are with COVID, the more likely they are to get longer term symptoms. But some people who get pretty mild disease can still be stuck with longer term symptoms. And even a symptom that is as mild as like they can't smell, you know, um, COVID knocks out your sense of smell for a lot of people. And some people don't get it back right away. That can be very, very hard. Um, you know, it affects your, your appetite. It affects your enjoyment of life. If you think about all the things that you like to smell. So the reason to get vaccinated is not just to stay out of the hospital and not just to die, but to avoid getting a syndrome like long COVID, um, which can be something that, you know, sticks around for a long time. That was actually a question of like two, three of my listeners about long COVID, just the effects. Uh, I, I just read an article um, for anybody who's local in Baltimore um, of a reporter from Jane Miller. She was explaining how she still is suffering from long COVID and she got COVID in, in last year. So that's that's been on a lot of people's uh, just vision. Just, hey, what, what do we do? What's, I mean, this is it's it's. it's Nervous, you know, you don't know the unknown. That's a scary part. It, it is scary. And I think it's really, it's really important because some people are scared of the vaccine because of the unknown. And they say, you know, look, vaccine's only been around for a year. Um, maybe we're going to find out five years from now something, something wrong, you know, is happening. That I hear that because I'm going out talking to people about vaccination quite a lot. I volunteer with the health department in Baltimore um, almost every weekend. And I hear that. And one of my answers to that is, Look, there is so much evidence on the safety of the vaccine, but the alternative to the vaccine isn't that you're totally fine. The alternative to the vaccine is you're probably going to get COVID. COVID is very infectious. And if you get COVID, there's a lot of uncertainty. You don't know what could happen. You don't know what the long-term effects of COVID are. So the real comparison here is a vaccine with tons of science and evidence and over 100 million people vaccinated on one side and the uncertainty of a new virus infecting your body and potentially causing these long-term symptoms, I am going to choose in a heartbeat getting the vaccine and protecting myself. A question from a a listener on Syracuse, New York. Um, He's asking, his name's Rory. He says, can you mix and match COVID vaccines? Um, Just because everybody, it's because it sounds like a cocktail. Yeah. And when you do all things that nature, you're mixing and matching. Anyway, I got the Pfizer. I don't want the Johnson & Johnson. Yeah. Again, you know, I don't, so it's kind of like mix and match. And we're not, I'm not pouring a martini and my mix of vodka and we rum. You get what I mean by that, Doc. But I, I do. It, it is, it's, it's a little unusual to have um, a doctor say, okay, you choose, you know, um, that, that's not what we're, what we're used to. Um, I think that uh, what we know um, about the core series, whether you pick, you know, the Moderna or Pfizer or Johnson Johnson, there's a lot of evidence that about the value of those vaccines. So I think what's generally recommended is you pick one for that first series. And then when you talk about the booster, that's where people talk about mixing and matching. And so if you got your first Pfizer, you might as well get the second one. That's where all the studies were. I got Moderna, I got a second Moderna. Then the question comes, you know, what about that third dose? You know, when your number is called for that third dose and a lot of people's number has been called for the third dose, you know, what do you do? And here um, there is not as much um, evidence to say one approach is different than another, but there are a number of scientists who think that if you do a different kind of vaccine from the one you originally got, it might actually boost your immune system more, um, particularly for people who got Johnson & Johnson first. So if you got Johnson Johnson first and you need a second shot, and right now they're recommending it for everyone who got Johnson and Johnson. So everyone who got Johnson Johnson, your number has been called. You should get a second shot. They say you could get Johnson Johnson, but there are a lot of uh, scientists who are saying, look, it looks like you get an extra boost if you get a second shot with Pfizer or Moderna. So that that is um, particularly something people are talking about. Um, in the end, though, you know, I think it's it'd be perfectly fine to go with the same one you had before particularly for Johnson Johnson, maybe pick one of the other two. But otherwise, it is just getting that that dose as it's recommended to you that probably makes the most difference. All right. So then that, that leads us into how accurate is home testing? Now, I'm going to give you I'm going to give you a story that my listeners have never heard before. And you did. You'll be the first person to hear this. OK, I took a home test. The home test came up positive. Now, I'm saying to myself, I have no symptoms. I had nothing. How is this even positive? 
I go to my local doctor, take the test, negative. So this leads in. So again, how accurate are these? I mean, I'm doing a, a test that a medical professional can do, and I'm trying. My, but my test was positive, and then a week later, after I got the positive, then I got the negative. The home test company sent a letter saying we had a lot of false positives. Really? Right. Not going to name the company because we don't do that here. We don't do that here. But how? I mean, so that was my experience of home testing. How accurate are they from from your data from you from a data standpoint? How accurate are they? So um, what sounds like happened right there is that there was some manufacturing problem or something like that with that test. And so um, I'm impressed that they sent the letter to you and you could have written back, you know, no kidding, right? <laughs> you know, you, 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 had, you already had the problem. You didn't have to tell me that, right? Um, the, the home tests, um, if they're manufactured well, should be pretty accurate, um, particularly for people who have high levels of virus like little bits of virus that people can get at the end of the illness or way at the beginning, they're probably not going to pick up as well as the um, other kinds of tests. The home tests are called antigen tests, and they generally um, work pretty well uh, when people are actually um, shedding a lot of virus. And that could mean you have symptoms or you don't have symptoms, but you're shedding a lot of virus. And if you get them and they're, they're the FDA authorized versions, I think you can have a pretty good degree of confidence. Now, let me give you a scenario. You're totally fine. You have no known exposures and you take a home test and it's negative. It kind of confirms like, why would you have COVID? So that makes sense, right? But now let's say you're sick, you're having trouble breathing, you can't smell, you were exposed to someone with COVID and your home test is negative. Do you go like, okay, no problem. No, you shouldn't do that. If the, the story, the rest of the story is pretty serious, you got to go in and, and get to, get a... Uh, probably a more sensitive test and really make sure what's going on. And one of the reasons to do that is if you're actually sick and you do have COVID, you want that diagnosis fast because you can get things like antibodies treatment that can keep you out of the hospital. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, I love hearing that. I love you explain that because a lot of people are hesitant about these home tests and they don't know, you know, where to go for these type of things. So thank you so much, doc, for that. I appreciate that. So we're going to go into the future. What the, what the future looks like. Um, from Stephanie, if very few people get the booster and many people are still unvaxxed, what will the statistics look like this spring? Will vaccinated people's immunity run out? So the answer to that excellent question and very fair question is I don't know for sure. You know, I don't think anybody knows for sure. Um, a lot of it will depend on whether there are, for example, new variants that come up. Right now, there are not any very concerning variants that people are you know, up at night worrying about, but that could change tomorrow. You know, um, the virus is constantly mutating. And if we have a new variant that makes it that the vaccines don't work as well, then we're going to see a bunch more cases and we're going to have to respond to that pretty quickly. So there's a, a, a fair amount of uncertainty. If we don't have a new variant, um, most of the models are predicting the cases will go down uh, quite a lot. Um, I think it's very likely that there will still be some immunity, even for people who don't get boosters, against serious illness. And probably what will drive the infections in places will be people who are not vaccinated at all. So it's just so important for people who are not vaccinated to get vaccinated. If you know people in your life, if, if you know people who are thinking like, I made it through this far, I'm not going to get sick. I've certainly bumped into them. You know, I, I'm going to stick with what's worked for me so far. They're sticking with Russian roulette. You know, they've won a game of Russian roulette so far, but are they going to, sure, they're going to keep winning that because if if they, you know, spin, spin the chamber and they have a problem, then you know it's too late to be vaccinated. And I think it's the time to really tell people like, look, you're not just protecting yourself, you're protecting Baltimore. I mean, let's talk about Baltimore. Now, Baltimore's done relatively well in the pandemic compared to a lot of other cities because people have the approach of like, I wanna protect my friends, my family, my community. And uh, Baltimore has one of the highest uh, vaccination rates in the country for similar communities. And it's because people really rallied around this and really getting people to see that this is something that we do for each other, including the people that we care about in our lives, I think is a really important step um, for making that spring a lot better than it otherwise would be. I love it. I love it. Uh, from our listener, her name is Miss, Miss Jen. Now that kids are five to 11, kind of, we kind of touched on this, can be vaccinated. 
Are we close to a time where masking will no longer be necessary? Um, We are close. I really do think we are close. As the number of cases come down and as the number of hospitalizations come down and now kids are going to be able to be vaccinated, I think um, we will start to see different um, trials of not you know, masking, for example, in schools. I think I think that is on the horizon. We obviously have to get a lot of kids vaccinated before that, and we have to watch what actually happens with the virus. But, you know, a vaccine is a pathway to normalcy, you know? And um, we're doing a podcast, uh, which was kind of exciting. It was our most complicated podcast. I walked around a school with the principal, and we talked to all these teachers and others about, you know, what it was like. And you could really tell that um, they were making the best that they could in Baltimore City uh, with this, but they they really were looking forward to the kids taking off the masks and kind of going back to full normalcy. And I think the vaccine will will make that day sooner whenever it comes. Next question for Ms. LaShawn. Are we closer to the end of the pandemic? And what lessons can be applied from this pandemic? Those are two very good, very good questions. Is it okay if I use a baseball analogy? Hey, let's do it. Let's do it. This is your. T- I, I, we are doing a crossover show. This is great. Whatever you want to do, it's our show. It's our part. <laughs> this hasn't been the best year for the Orioles, but we're going to use a baseball <laughs> analogy anyway. Which is, I think, for the pandemic, I'm hoping we're we're probably in the seventh inning, maybe the eighth inning of nine innings. You know, baseball games usually have nine innings. Hopefully, we won't go into extra innings. Um, I think we um, had the first very horrible few innings. You know, when there. So many people got sick and we had to shut down so much of our lives. Um, Then there was the middle innings. We were getting vaccine out there, you know, and and like I said, Baltimore has really uh, led the way with a lot of outreach. I go out and vaccinate with the city health department in a a grocery store, you know, catching people on the way to get the groceries and, you know, a very, very good response. And now we're kind of towards the end of the game, the seventh, maybe eighth inning, where we're seeing cases come down, um, we're getting vaccine for younger kids, and hopefully we will be in a position where, you know, it will never go away completely, but COVID will start to fade into the background. And, you know, recently there's news that there's medication treatments out for COVID. So all those things are going to help put it a, a little bit more in the background. But I will say this, you know, at the end of a baseball game, you need good relief pitching to win, right? You need to bring someone in, you get a close strong. You can't let someone else score 10 runs at the, in, at the end of the game. So, you know, that's what Baltimore has to do. That's what other places in this country have to do. You know, um, if you throw your hands up and say, forget it, I don't want to, you know, have any anything to do with COVID anymore, forget the vaccine, forget the masks, then you wind up like places right now in Colorado where they don't have enough nurses to take care of the patients, or they're, you know, or, or Idaho where they um, had to decide who lives or who dies, you know, with crisis standards of care or Mississippi where they converted a uh, parking garage into an intensive care unit or, or big outside hospital, you know? And so um, we uh, we have to close strong. Um, and I think we will get to a point, if we can do that, that while it's not completely gone, it really fades in our lives and we kind of get to a new normal. Yeah, I want to plug, I can't remember what episode it was, but it was an amazing episode you had. And it was with uh, the health, she was in Tennessee maybe, I want to say. and. She found out that she was in rural Tennessee and that her they had, they had a lot of conflict. And she found out that most African Americans had taken the shot, but the most of the white people that were in the suburbs didn't think it was interesting how she broke it down. It was one of the we have several episodes, but it was very interesting to hear her and her husband made a family and living and things of that nature. Now they're moving from that area because they didn't want her telling the truth about COVID. So I love what you're talking about because this brings back to again, you have amazing podcast and I recommend people to listen to it because it's such education and I, I live by it. every every week comes out I'm on it now so I want to ask you a question because you interview so many great Baltimore leaders on the podcast and one of the things that's impressed me about Baltimore compared to places you know for example like Tennessee is that the political leadership has really been supportive of a strong response to COVID do you think that's a fair statement uh, uh, absolutely absolutely every every political leader I mean I've Interview Corey McSenator, Corey McRae, a delegate, uh, um, Brooke Learman, Ryan Dorsey. Uh, and uh, we always ask the question, you know, COVID was uncharted territory. What did we do? And they said, 
We did everything we could possibly do to help businesses, first of all, to make sure businesses were outside, making sure we keep those permits for another year so we can be safer, making sure people get the shot, you know, getting incentives. Baltimore has been on top of it from the, from day one. And I cheerlead our leaders for doing that. And I can't, I have no complaints about what they're doing right now. You know, back in the, the campaign for mayor, um, a number of candidates wanted to do information sessions as part of their campaign events. And, um, you know, I went to the people at Hopkins and said, like, typically we don't do campaign events, but I want to do them all. Right. I'll do them for any candidate. And I did a whole bunch of them. And they were all great. Like all the candidates for mayor were like, we want people to have the facts. We want people to know how they can protect themselves. And we saw that across two mayors who have been very candid with people and really interested in in saving lives. I think that's made a big difference. Compare that to places where you have people who say, you know, COVID's a hoax or, you know, masking is a form of, you know, government control and doesn't help at all. Or the vaccines are, are like tracking you. You know, there are people who are actually leaders who are saying those things. And to me, it's made a big difference. And, you know, podcasts like yours that give them a platform to to talk to people directly, make a big difference. Well, it's funny. It's interesting you say that because you, uh, I interviewed Rebecca Jones. I don't know if you know the name by chance. She is the she was the whistleblower in Florida. And she basically got in trouble with and got fired and things of that nature for Ron DeSantis. And I interviewed her and I, we talked about everything. And it was an eye-opening interview. That was probably not number, number three top interview because people were so blown away about her story and how they how discredit her, her background. You know, her personal life has nothing to do with what she does nine to five. And that's what I was trying to explain to people. And it's just, I see other places compared to us. And I'm like, we're light years ahead of what's going on. And we've saved many, our political leaders have saved many lives, you know, just like any, like, you know, in other states, I can't say it for them, you know, but our political leaders have done an excellent job. Yeah. You know, we had a, couple of researchers at the School of Public Health compare Baltimore's experience with a group of uh, counties with uh, similar uh, populations as Baltimore. And, you know, we had, um, we were very much in the low group for the number of deaths, number of cases, and we were in the very, very high group for the number of vaccinations. And, I, you know, I give the most credit to people in Baltimore, but I really do give a lot of credit to Baltimore's leaders and the consistency of the message, which I think that was really, really, really important to the city. And, you know, one thing I'm doing starting uh, next year, and I, I don't know how you guys feel about this at uh, John Hopkins, is I'm actually doing live pop-up shows uh, and, you know, I'm making sure everybody's vaccinated at the show, but I've started doing them and I would love to have you or uh, just an expert come on and have people listen to this because I think it's very important to hear from when you guys heard about COVID, when it started, when did we know it was a big crisis? What was some of the reaction, um, how we handle it? What were some things we looked back in the past that we, we could have done, done this a little bit better? Because I think people want to hear the truth. They don't want to be sugarcoated anymore. Just tell us the truth. Let us know what's going on. You know, I I, I remember going to the doctor's office with my son, and it was in January. And my and I, my pediatrician was wearing a mask. And I was like, she's never wearing a mask in the office. She's never worn a mask. And she said, oh, well, I, was, I, I came up from Disney and everybody was sick. And I was like, hmm. And then literally uh, three months later, or not even about a month later, where I'm out of work, working at home. And so it makes me want to stuff my dog in the background. But it just one of those things where I, I would love to have that conversation in a live show. That's something that I throw to you guys. It's, I think it's very important to people to hear that. Yeah, anytime, any place. That sounds like so much fun. As you probably figured out, I really like to talk about this stuff. That's why I go out and volunteer and we'll talk to people, you know, um, around Baltimore about uh, their ex their experiences, their thinking, and the questions that they have. And, you know, I agree completely with what you just said, that honesty is really important. You know, you can't, can't go out there and say the vaccines have no potential for side effects. Sure, everything has side effects. And let's talk about what those are and what the balance is against the benefits for the vaccines. You know, what's going to happen? What, what do we hope happens? What do we think is going to happen? What might happen that's bad? You know, how do you think about that? People have really good questions. And the most important thing is to be honest with them in, in the answers. I love it. I have one more, a couple more questions. I know we have to go, but I just want to ask real quick. I had from, from Deidre. She says he lives in California. What about traveling? What are the risks of not wearing a mask traveling, like on an airplane or anything like that? What are the risks if you're vaccinated? 
So um, the risk is you could get COVID um, because you can get a breakthrough infection, even people who are vaccinated. People who are vaccinated and generally if they're younger are still pretty unlikely to get very sick. You know, they might get an infection, they might feel sick and stay home, um, but they're unlikely to be hospitalized, very unlikely to die. Now, somebody, if if is it Deidre? If Deidre is like 85 years old, you know, um, she could be at more serious risk because older adults can get very more, more serious breakthrough infections. Or if she has an immunocompromise or something like that, if you don't wear a mask, you're at more risk of a more serious infection. Um, it is required to wear a mask on an airplane, you know, I think for good reason, so that people don't get sick and pass it on to someone who could get very sick. Um, that's that's really what what's at stake um, right now. Now, if you're not vaccinated, you know you could get quite sick. I mean that that's really the the fact. Um, even though there are not that many as many people getting going to the hospitals we used to have in Baltimore or elsewhere, um, if you're not vaccinated, you're a sitting duck for COVID. COVID's very excited to meet you, and you could get quite ill. And even even though there are some good treatments, they're not perfect, and we still have you know around a thousand people dying every day in the United States. Uh, uh, you know, we, we could talk all day. I, I've, I've enjoyed all this. I know you have things going on. Um, my last question for you, going into the Thanksgiving holiday, talking with family, COVID's going to be number one story. Where do we go from now? Where do we go from here? I mean, next year, where you said the seventh inning. Do we, do I need to take a booster at six months? Because I just got my booster shot. Just got my booster. Do I need to take a booster six months from now? Or is this going to be like the flu? That that's going to be the question. And will people want to be getting injected again and again from again? Let me. I know we do for flu, but now what are we doing with COVID? Is this going to be something that next summer I got to take another booster shot? So I, I think that the conversation we should be having is we're not going back to 2019. Okay, 2019 happened in 2019, but it's not going to happen in 2022. 2022 is going to happen in 2022. And what is 2022 going to be like? It's going to be a new normal, you know, and what, what's that going to be? There are different components and I'll get to the vaccine. I think that when um, there are a lot of people sick, first of all, I think people are going to stay home when they're sick a lot more than we used to, you know, like who wants to get someone else sick, even if it's not COVID. So I, I think that's a good change. Number two, I think that when a lot of people are sick, we might actually recommend that people start to wear masks indoors for a few days, like at the peak of flu season or if COVID surges, like let's let's all, you know, put our masks back on, kind of like let's carry an umbrella if it is um, raining. And in fact, there's a new uh, center that's going to essentially do weather forecasts for infectious disease. And the new normal might be that, you know, all of us have a few masks at home and sometimes we wear them because it'll protect us and other people, but just for a few days and then we go back. I mean, it seems kind of weird right now, but that could be what our kids and grandkids consider to be normal in the future. I hope that there are some policy changes that we learn from COVID, that we learn that we can't let certain inequities stand, you know, that communities that are vulnerable to um, misinformation, but also to the effects of a virus because of all kinds of um, uh, deprivation and challenges that they face, that we should address some of those challenges. So there's a new policy normal we want to get to um, that really makes us healthier as a city and as a country. And then on vaccines, what's the new normal for vaccines, which was your question. Um, so um, there are two issues. There's a booster for the same vaccine, essentially, we already got, or are they going to change the vaccine, which is kind of what they do for the flu vaccine. They change it every year. I think most people think that with this booster dose, it's probably going to be good for a while. It's unlikely for this strain of the virus, we're going to need yet another shot very soon. You know, we don't know for sure because we'll have to see what happens with immunity, but um, it probably will last at least a year. Some people think at least a couple of years before we're, we're, we're doing uh, anything different. However, if there's a different version of the virus that's causing a problem, like I said, you know, the, the some of the worst case scenarios are there's a new variant of the virus that the current vaccine doesn't work, then what they can easily do is change the vaccine. That's kind of like the flu where they would, they would actually change the vaccine. And we would be lining up, not for a booster, they wouldn't call it a booster, they call it essentially a different COVID shot. 
Right now, the current vaccines work so well against Delta and other variants that there there really isn't a serious move right now to to put together a different vaccine or to endorse a different vaccine. But that could well change, and it really will depend on what the virus does. We have to stay a step ahead of the virus. We're in the closing innings here. We got to have a good relief pitcher. We got to keep our eye on the ball. You know, um, if the virus changes, we got to be ready with our vaccines and other things. And we got to keep in mind, like, okay, it might be a hassle to get another shot, but you know, it's a real big hassle, like going into the hospital and struggling to breathe and possibly um, putting yourself and the health of the people you love at risk. He just dropped jewels and gems, folks. He just dropped jewels and gems. It's a whole. This is a made episode. He just dropping it, just telling people how it is, and we really appreciate the time that you've given No Picks of a Dark podcast. This has been an amazing episode and I hope you guys go check this episode out. Check out, I mean, Dr. Josh Sharstein, amazing, amazing. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. And um, I hope all of our listeners from around the country check out No Picks After Dark. So many great conversations, political leaders, artists, you know, business leaders, so many interesting topics that you cover. And today, such great questions. So thanks so much. Check out Public Health On Call, the John Hopkins. Please check him out. We would love to run this back and do a part two because I feel like the chemistry was great here and it was just the flow, ebb and flow of this conversation was amazing. And there's so many things that we should call the doctor's call and do something like that soon. I mean, I think people really want to know just because, again, you told people want to know the truth. And I think I've learned a lot today. And I know my listeners are real excited to hear this. And hopefully the, everybody listens to this before Thanksgiving or Christmas and understand how important this is. And we want everybody to be safe and have a happy holiday. Absolutely. Um, have a wonderful holiday, Aaron Dante. And congratulations on your award-winning podcast. Hey, thank you so much. Thank you for John Hopkins. Again, you guys have a congratulations on your awards. You guys are one of amazing awards. Congratulations. Let's do, let's do some more. Let's do some more beautiful work for the city of Baltimore and all over. Really appreciate you. Talk to you soon. All right. Public Health On Call is produced by Josh Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, and Stephanie Desmond. Audio production by Spencer Greer, Niall Owen McCusker, and Matthew Martin with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Production support from Catherine Ricardo. Social media support from Grace Holes Fernandez and Caroline Wong. Thank you for listening. Thank you.